Jim, we're back continuing our strength and conditioning coach profession series. So we've talked so many topics, motivation, and ability, all that stuff. Today we're talking knowledge. And you've actually been on mm-hmm. record saying our knowledge is going to become less and less important. So that's an, an interesting place we could take this conversation. But just give us the general overview on knowledge and strength and conditioning and why it's important. Yeah. And that's a really good opening because that's a big area that I'm struggling with. I actually just got a question today about that from Phil Byer, Kansas State. And I joked about AI doesn't know the human psyche like I do, which I say that affectionately, but that's kind of the, the root of how we're going to overcome these things. Like, so when we're thinking about knowledge, there's, there's a couple of ways we want to look at this. We can look at this much like training, right? There's a lot of a synergy between developing an athlete with developing strength coaches knowledge in a lot of ways, same thing with skill and ability. But you think about it, there's, I can address weak spots or gaps. And that would be the same thing of addressing it for an athlete of someone has structural imbalance, someone has a massive deficiency, right? That we're looking at from percentile ranks within their, the top in the, the sport or the position, and they fall in the 10th percentile. Okay, that's a, obviously an area that's weighing them down. Same thing in strength and conditioning. You know, you have the, the big domains from the cueing or exercise performance or execution. You have the programming, and that goes into session design, meso, microcycle, mesocycle, macrocycle design. Then you look at it from the organizations and methods and protocols. These are all really interesting areas that you can go into things like nutrition or sports psychology. You have a lot of different domains you can dive into and you can start to inventory big domains as a, I, what are my deficiencies? Where am I really low in percentile in regards to my peers? Let's say that the top of the food chain is going to be that person making high six figures, seven figures, working in the team sector, and then everyone else is working off of them. And what attributes do they have? versus what I have. And I start to look at it from a reverse engineering effect of in order for me to get net closer to them, I have to work on these areas that are essentially weighing me down and holding me back to get into that outcome. But then the other part is accentuating a strength, right? And we see this all the time in training as well, right? That, you know, look at Dennis Rodman of an extreme archetype of very fixed in one thing that he does. He happens to be the best in the world at that. And you look at the diversity of skill you need to play basketball. And this guy just singled in on rebounding. And then you look at that from the other end, from a strength and conditioning coach. We see this again all the time. Sports science, exercise performance or execution, nutrition, program design. These are all domains that potentially might have a lot of weight in getting you notoriety or getting you fast track to that, but creates an artificial ceiling as well. And we start to look at maybe potentially that strategy of acquiring knowledge has to go back again to what do you want? I want to be a head strength coach. Okay, well, you have to be very broad in general with a lot of things you do. One of the common misconceptions that when you move up to head strength coach, you don't have more freedom to do strength conditioning. You actually have less ability or time to spend on program design and actually coaching. You're you're more diverse with the things that you have to do in a day to be successful. And I think that's a big struggle. A struggle for me, struggle for a lot of my counterparts. I get very fixed on Okay, I want to be the best program in the world. I want to be the best coach on every single floor that I'm coaching on. I want to have the, the biggest net impact to the athlete on a daily basis. And then you move, then you're good. And then you move up into head strength coach. And then you're in meetings after meetings after meetings, just bureaucratic, like nonsense. And, and talking to people that are essentially holding you back from the things that you really want to do. And the greatest irony in the world when you're in most of these meetings is they're talking about what they what we should do if we had interface or face to face with our student athletes and you're sitting in your back of your mind. And the irony is if I was allowed to be with my student athletes, I'd be able to actually interject and make that change. We're trying to talk about what we do systemically here, but that's the truth of, of that. And you have to be very influential in a lot of different spaces, working with coaches, working with administration, working with sports medicine, working with nutrition, working with psychology, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And you have to be more of a mayor. And I think that part becomes very confusing. And if you look at that first on the job training of, okay, now I'm the guy, I'm the person in charge of an athletic, of a strength conditioning department, and I'm responsible for hiring and developing, responsible for coordinating with the coaches and, and facilities and every, all these other components, I had very little 
working knowledge or skill development from the actual job of being a head strength coach. I was exceptional in program design, coaching or execution, nutrition, sports science, all of the, the more I could control this with time and effort versus I have to be more strategic and I have to be more political and I have to be more, play the long game with every single aspect. Everything now is an asset and I need to leverage that asset to getting our more resources and more time and more ability with our staff and our, our weight room and our athletes. And that becomes a very paradoxical thing. So it gets into that, what do you want? Well, I want to be a head strength coach. Okay, well, you look at the books behind me, a lot of these books were useless towards that job. And then you start to think about, well, maybe I just wanted to be very specialized. Maybe I just wanted to be a, just this recluse in the corner programming and breaking down things and having an interaction with the athletes, because that's what I genuinely aspire and want to do. And it was this realization that careful what you wish for, because you just might get it. And then all of a sudden you realize, I didn't want that job. I just wanted the money associated with it or the prestige associated with it or the, the power and the authority that I could have with it. And what I realized is I just want to be free to do the things that I really want to do. And there's always exchanges you make all the time. But when you think about acquiring knowledge, going back to that what and, and saying, okay, well, I want to be very specialized. Okay, we well, have to become in the, the top percentile in terms of knowledge and ability in that particular domain to be able to get a job that's one, paying you enough and two, having enough job security where you could keep doing that. And if you realize that, hey, I don't have the bandwidth and the motivation to do that, you got to go back to your why. And you realize maybe I need to change the focus point to be very specialized. Or I want the prestige and the authority, which is the same thing of someone in the private sector saying, I just want to be an influencer. I want to have that platform to speak on national conferences and be the, be the face of that athletic department's sport development. I want to have recognition because that, that matters. Mm -hmm. Put aside your, your thoughts of, oh yeah, you're just a vanity person or you're just doing this for selfish reasons. Who's not, right? If I were to break down going, getting two bachelor's degrees, two master's degrees, interning for thousands of hours, doing four internships before I got a $30,000 a year job. Do you think I was doing this because it was my God, calling from God? I was doing this for the aspiration to be a head strength coach, to have the prestige associated with it. That I sacrifice weddings and funerals and being away from friends and family and relationships so I can have that notoriety. And yes, I have an a opportunity to do a great job for people and influence people. But when I looked at what I would need to become a head strength coach, I needed to start to think about what are the knowledge gaps that I have. And I became focused in on accentuating something that was already really good in terms of program design, coaching execution. And honestly, just sports science, nutrition, anything that I thought was interesting and intriguing that I, if I just committed myself to, I've become knowledgeable and capable of. But what dawned on me is when I became a head strength coach, I never worked on management skills. I never worked on staff hiring or firing. I never worked on coordinating and interacting with other departments. I never worked the, or now I'm in the politic game and I don't really have a much of a bandwidth to handle that. And ego or pride or being self-conscious really limited myself from accentuating myself in that position. And that would be the message to you of, okay, well, you got to go back to what do you want? Why do you want it? And then do you have the motivation to get past the sticking point of becoming a head strength coach or a very specialized strength coach? And then you start to ask yourself, if I don't have the motivation to do that, do I really want it? Because that's the definition of motivation. You're willing to do the things that you don't want to do in order to get what you want. Motivation to do things that you're already, you're good at and you want aren't, isn't really useful motivation. You need to be motivated to do things that you're not motivated to do. And that would get you, you know, what you don't have. You know, coach Munkin would say this all the time in army, in order for us to change the streak, there's going to be a couple things that need to be in place. We need to be good enough to do something about it. And we need to be tired of hearing about it. And I think the same thing for getting the, the career vector that you want, you need to be good about it, good enough. And that comes into the two areas that we're talking about ability and knowledge. And then you need to be tired of not having it. And you're building, willing to do what you need to get to get it. And I think that's the part that becomes so challenging for most people. And we've, we've talked about this a lot, but, oh, I'm going to get a master's degree because that's going to be necessary. 
you're a crappy coach. We just evaluated you. You're on the floor. You don't make a difference with your athletes. You can't connect. You have no human skills. This is a service industry. You should put aside the idea of a master's degree is going to get you something. In fact, it's only going to make you stronger in your conviction that you're good when you're not. And that's okay. No one's good when they start coaching. I think that's right. the hard part to tell someone they're not good at something. Of course you're not. You've never done it. You know, go through this with my son all the time. He gets frustrated because he's not good at things that he tries. Like, why would you expect to be good at something you've never tried before? Oh. It defies logic. But the same thing with strength conditioning. And then you say, okay, I'm going to start making decisions. I'm going to start to invest in myself. I'm going to get more education and knowledge in this stuff. But it could be something you're already really good at or knowledgeable about, knowledgeable about. Like a lot of times people just want to be in a very safe space. Like I'm good with Olympic lifts. So I'm going to go to USAW, which is a fine conference, but do you really need to go to a conference in that? Is it going to get you a job that you don't already have an opportunity to get at that versus, Hey, I'm a weightlifter. I have no discernible skill in terms of return to play nutrition, or even something like speed development. Okay. Well, you got to get out there. You got to get outside this bubble. And I find that's something that's alarming for, for a lot of people because it serves this thing of, well, how bad do you really want it? Do you have the motivation to really get what, do with necessary? You know, same thing we talked about. I was just on Dr. Laval's podcast last week and he's like, where do you start? I'm like, how bad do you want it? What are you willing to do for it? And the same thing with coaching. I want to be a head strength coach. How bad do you want it? What are you willing to do for it? I really want it. Okay. Are you willing to go to conferences that you have no interest in going to? Are you willing to be in meeting after meeting after meeting? Are you willing to work out a path of hiring the best staff, developing that staff? And then when that staff gets really good, they're going to leave and you can replace them. That never ending process of half staff hiring, developing, it's just, it's just a revolving door. That's your value prop. Well, I'm tired of interns. Then you shouldn't be a trade coach because that's your lifeblood. That is your currency to new staff. And if you don't know, have an ability to develop people from off the street, are you really worth your value as an administrator, right? The definition of middle management, which you kind of are when you're a head strength coach, we're not the peak, we're not the bottom, we're right there in the middle, is be able to develop your cohort of people to a level that contributes to the positive outcome every single year. And one of the things that becomes so evident with head strength coaches is this struggle to develop coaches. And I think one of the best calls I get, because it always makes me laugh about just how to add to the curve I always was, because I always took the, all right, I need to be able to get interns. I need to be able to develop that interns. Part of it, I wanted a platform and an audience, but the other part of it, it was like, I'm going to build a Rolodex of coaches. I'm going to hire one day when I'm a head strength coach, because I had that foresight. But hey, do you got a guy? Nah, I got plenty of people they're all really good question would be would that opportunity be squandered if they go work for you if you could throw a lot of money at them go go have fun take them i think you better at it. better better serve to have that money and then not and then the the realization of like i thought it would be more stimulating or engaging yeah well you know that's that's the kind of the way it goes or on the other end of people leave there as soon as they get there because it's not a great place to work because you don't really take care of your employees. You don't develop them and cultivate them and spend time with them and listen to them and have empathy because you were there at one point yourself as well. You created this weird, weird, like, arist what's the term there? Aristocrat aristocratic type of approach of, like, there's nobility and noble, and then there's all the, the, the lower level. Nowhere shall there be a cross between, you know, like your loyal servants to the almighty king or queen. You know, that, that process is... It's such an interesting dynamic because think about that. There are the people that your athletic department is paying off the, off of your insight and your, your thought process. This would be a good person for the athletic department. And I'm not going to spend any time or invest any interest in developing them or helping them bring more, right? That when I offer them a certain amount per year and they want to make more money at the end of the year, but. In between that, they have no actual physical development or knowledge development. Why should they make more money? And, and what is your value as a middle manager? You know, that, that process too. So I guess surmising what, what I, what I should have just said off the beginning, you know, where does knowledge fit into? It goes into, we can accentuate a strength. We can accentuate, we can start to develop weaknesses, but it all leads into, what do you want? Do I want to be an expert generalist? So as far as... A, a young coach 
Sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt you. A young coach no. sort of figuring out, like, learning is hard. Do you recommend they stay general until they really solidify that what they want? Or do they just start with what they want and then really dive into the weeds on that right off the bat? What, what do you think? So this is a tough one because young person out there, I hope you don't mind, but you're dumb and you're naive. Like you're just stupid and you're lazy and you're naive. You know, they, myself included. Like I'm not like, right. I'm not above this to saying it, but anyone under the age of 25 is dumb, naive, and just quite frankly, self entitled. And what I find is this, all right, Hey, this very binary focus general or focus specific at a certain factor. What I would tell you is less about there's a right answer at that point. What I would focus on if you were being mentored by me is where you're more interested in and how do I get you past a certain threshold, right? Where you have enough invested into this profession where you are going to be more inclined to develop yourself. And that part is the, the critical window, right? And you see this all the time with all the sports that we like playing growing up, you probably tried everything, right? Like my, my dad was really fired up when I decided I didn't like hockey because it's a really expensive sport. And he's like, I don't have to travel around the country and do weird practice times. Like that was great for me. But the reason why I stopped because I wasn't good at it and I didn't like it enough to go past to say that with plenty of sports, right. Or mm -hmm. I didn't see the long-term viable option for me and I ended up playing football, basketball, like the wrong, the wrong archetype to play those two sports, but I liked it. And I worked hard at it. And I think the same thing with learning and knowledge and getting into a new vocation, right? The, I, hey, I know you're motivated and excited, but you're going to focus on basic general things every day. Just get on the floor and coach. That's it. Just shut your mouth and coach. Like that's a pretty good way to derail anyone who's hyper motivated versus yeah, I'm, you know, I'm not going to be very much so indebted to the process and I want to grind away at it. I'm a, I'm a person that's good on the floor. You tell me what to do. I'll do it. And then when you think I'm ready for the next opportunity, I'll go do it. And then you go, okay, I'm going to lean on that person that, and then I'm going to try to implore that person. You got to get in a book, got to get in some articles. You got to get to seminars versus the other person that probably doesn't have the stomach to being told by a, a division one athlete, you know, to pardon my French, but go to hell. That dynamic becomes very problematic when that person saying, you have no outlet to remind you of why you're in this because you're really curious and passionate about strength conditioning and sports science. But here's the biggest obstacle. It's getting in front of these athletes and learning how to communicate with them and getting them to do things they can't or won't. You know, we talked about that in the beginning, that our value prop is getting people to do things that they either can't or won't do. And in between that, you can be better at making decisions that what they should be doing. But hey, on the front end, I can make really high level decisions, but Actually, the point that actually changes that and they're getting the output, this is where the buck stops. I would implore you to start focus on that thing that actually makes the difference versus the thing that you're hypothetically doing from all the models and the constructs that you're trying to use to make better decisions, but the rate limiting fact there. And the same thing for other folks, like they're on the floor, they need to make their way back to making better decisions on the front end, but don't lose, take that away from that entirely. Like use this one to two hour period in between groups to get a, get, get a book open or go through an online course or, Hey, we're going to have a month in May where you're going to go out there and hit the seminar. Cause I think it would help you and back and forth in that and just trying to figure out, okay, well, how do I get this person past this threshold of this is new. They're fragile. They are the first time in their life, probably not told that they're great because of they were just born or exist. And they turned an interest into a hob or into a hobby, into a actual vocation and the realization that is no longer about them at all. And that's a heavy realization in the face trying to figure out that because, and I was just joking about this as well. So this is very top of mind of, you know, what's the talent pool we're getting in strength conditioning? Is it, oh, we're competing with Harvard for people who have an opportunity to go to Harvard business school, or is it the person that's getting an associate's degree going, man, I don't want to do with my life. Maybe I'll get a trade or I'll become a strength coach. Like it's probably more skewed to that. Not bad. And there's plenty of, I would say probably really intelligent people that zeroed in on a trade that make a whole lot more money and are way more successful than me. But yep. I think it gets into this level of 
when you have a lower general intelligence or you have less of a network, you know, your options become dwindled and you have to accentuate this motivation, skill, and knowledge in all times in order to get the most from that employee. And if I got a person who has very poor actual like knowledge, okay, well, I got to get with that person and work on. And if they might tell me like, nah, it's all about the work. You just got to get on the floor and work. Okay. I got, I got a, I got a mule here. I got, I got a workhorse. This guy can go to work every single day. I got to figure out ways to educate this person. So when we're not getting to the program design, he's not a limiting factor. On the other end, I got the person who just got their master's degree, delayed that the whole thing of getting on the floor and coaching. And then we put them on the floor and they're pretty much just like uncomfortable. Like it is awkward. And my players are coming up to me like, Who, well, who's the nerd? And that part becomes challenging as well. And okay, well, I got to tease them into that situation. And I got to start to work with that, that coach to develop that. And it could be, all right, we're going to get in front of them and we're going to, we're going to work through some things I want you to learn. Or, hey, we're going to get you in these situations and we're going to improv these scenarios of like, hey, we're going to. Four sets of three front squat with a four RXO tempo, getting in there, the athlete just stops and he goes, I don't want to do this. What do you do in that situation? You got to workshop it. You got to start doing it and you start to create these situations where that person has to improve. And as an administrator, it is a hard thing to realize that you're never getting a finished product and your job is to make them closer and closer to a asset and a contributor, as opposed to, I'm just closing the door, turn off the lights going through Excel and trying to create the, the world's perfect program. I found the unified theory of training, right? I've just taken in all these different resources and I put it in there and then I'm on the floor. Like I am the best coach on this floor. That doesn't matter anymore that you have to have other mediums as the value that you can bring. And again, going into motivating a young coach, like as administrator, you got to be ready for that. You have to be ready for that and you have to look at what incentivize them and why they're there. You know, one of the unspoken things about when you're at a division one power five school and you get an intern that moves in from out of state and they spend their money, they buy the lease for the summer, they get a lot vested into that. And as a administrator, essentially you're their first exposure to the real world. And they're the first time they leave the nest, right? They go to college, pretty safe. They're, pr they're pretty, they're pretty nurtured in a college environment. Then you get into, okay, I moved to Nowheresville, Mississippi, and I'm living for the first time in a place I've never been before. And the only reason why I'm here is for this college internship. And they come to work and they just get thrown through the meat grinder and they go home and they come back the next day and the same thing, same thing, same thing. I have a lot of authority if that person has a lot of vested time and interest into this versus the person that's already at school and, and oh, I want to do this part-time. I only want to go maybe Tuesday, Thursday from three to six. And that person really can just come and go as they please, right? There's no sunk cost. And you start to evaluate who's going to be the bigger value prop. And at certain schools, you can get away with it, right? If you have a big logo on your back and you can say, all right, I have a freedom. I have the benefit of choice here so I can be selective and I can only pull out of state kids who have a lot of experience before this. And this is their, this is their catalyst to getting what they ultimately want. Your incentives through the roof versus I'm at a non power five school. I'm at a div division three school, a JUCO school. I'm at a high school. You get what you get and you don't get upset. And the person's going to be on the conditions of them. Like I'm doing you a favor. What is your value prop to motivating that guy and incentivizing? Him? Like you don't need a whole lot of skill to motivate the kid who just moved 3000 miles away, who has no other worldly experience and putting all his chips on the table for this one opportunity versus I'll be here on Tuesday from three to six. Maybe I'll see ya. Do you. What are you going to do? Motherfuck that kid for not being there. I think that's the part that gets really problematic for how do I motivate and incentivize the kid? And you know, that, that part too, of like, you can bound your head, bound your head against the wall. Of like if they don't have the motivation to take constructive criticism and feedback, maybe they shouldn't be there. And maybe you should just say, this isn't working. You should go somewhere else. And that part is really hard for coaches as well. So to answer your question, it depends on what you're going to get that person past this sticking point to get them to ultimately be a valuable asset for you and your department. That's a good perspective.
I really like the idea of the head strength coach as the middle manager too. It's such a, you, know, you, don't, you don't hear that side of things a lot. So, so hey, Brad, this was awesome, Tim. What an ego, what an ego dip too though, right? Like you just middle man to it, man. Like it is what it is. Like it's tough. Like, and that's the part where I think most people, you're not the CEO. You're not even the chief operating officer. You're just the, the guy below the guy below the guy and above the other guy. That's it. And you might have a big, big power stroke in your actual department. But when you get into a meeting, I could tell you my time in army, like, you think I was solicited a whole lot for my opinion or anything? You think I had a massive influence on big decisions? I had a big control of my space, which is what ultimately my direct supervisor wanted for me. Just control my space and not be a liability, right? Not have staff that was a decrement to the performance of our athletes or the university. But on the other end of it, you, know, you go up that higher level meeting, like our administration definitively told me they don't care about my opinion multiple times. And here I am, I am by far and away the smartest person in every room I was walking into. And I'm not afraid to say that. It's absolutely yeah. true. And people can confirm that. But in terms of my influence, minuscule, like yeah. nothing. And you talk about like getting knocked down a peg and maybe that was the reason why I left that situation because I was, I was, maybe disillusioned with the idea that I was better than I was. And then you get the ultimate, how good really are you? And you start to realize it wasn't a matter of what I knew or what I was capable of. It was a matter of how much I could convince others that I was influential and important. And I, once I became a commercial business owner, I realized I wasn't very good at that. And then go into another, I'm now a private business owner and I have no discernible skills to sell or market or do anything. And now I have to, completely extend myself in a direction I haven't been before. So yeah, to your, to your point of like, it's an interesting thing. And I hope that doesn't diminish the value of a head strength coach. It just means that we should become more aware of the job. We are conduits from performance staffs doing their job on a daily basis and communicating to our coaches and administration that we are worth the investment, both from the time and the monetary monetary value that we contribute to strength conditioning in off season and in season. Yeah, I, I thought this was great, and uh, I appreciate you diving into some uh, some of that stuff. I appreciate it. All right, all right.